Hi, everybody. All right, so um, I hope you guys are enjoying your day. Um, we have started um, Thanksgiving break here at the Roberts house, so my kiddos might be running back and forth. Um, but I wanted to go through and go ahead and open up module four. That way, if you had some opportunities this week, um, I definitely want you guys to have a good break and enjoy some relaxation. That's very important. But I also know that if you have a little bit of downtime, you might want to go ahead and get started on module four. So I wanted to go through, I'm going to share my screen and go through the PowerPoint with you. Also have an opportunity to um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, let's see here. Okay, so module four, we are going to be talking a lot about scaffolding, differentiation, vocabulary, objective writing, and lesson planning. I know some of you have already written some lesson plans, so this might be review. Some of you, this is the first time you're hearing about lesson planning, so it might be some really valuable information that you might want to start looking at and um, kind of keep this link in your back pocket. So we'll go through some of that. You will get to write a lesson plan as part of your application task for Module 4, and you can use this for your um, um, internship classes if you haven't already done that Lesson 3. Um, but... I'm not expecting you to do an entire lesson plan. So we're just gonna do some parts of it today. So what is scaffolding a lesson? I want you to think through what does the word scaffolding mean to you? And it can mean different things in different environments. My husband works construction. So when I ask him, what does scaffolding mean to you? He thinks of scaffolding on a building side where there's different areas, different heights, and it helps support you as you are working on the building. When we're thinking about it in the educational realm, I want you to think of what the opposite of scaffolding would be. It would be like saying to a group of fifth graders something like this. Read this nine-page science article, write a detailed essay on the topic it explores, and turn it in by Wednesday. Holy cow, they're going to look at you like, okay, you've lost your ever-loving mind, or they're going to attempt it, but maybe they'll just do one of the four or five different tasks. So scaffolding, without scaffolding, there's no support. There's no safety net, no parachute. You're just kind of left to, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do? So I want you to think of scaffolding as that safety net. You're, you're providing help along the way. So we're going to talk about what does that look like versus differentiation. So when I'm scaffolding an assignment, it is the same assignment. Think of the S for scaffolding, the S for same. You might be breaking up the learning into more manageable chunks, into different sections. You might be providing a tool or a structure, a strategy to help you. Um, give the information to your students. We've talked a lot about different reading strategies and in your textbook you have before, during, and after reading strategies. Think about that as ways to scaffold an assignment. Now when we're thinking differentiation, the word different is um, easy to see in there. So I want you to think about differentiation as a completely different assignment Maybe I'm shortening the text or altering it, or I'm modifying whatever assignment might follow it, but I'm doing something different. In a universal design lesson, where I'm thinking, what can I do to benefit the majority of my students, it might be some differentiation. For certain students, they might benefit from a completely different assignment. So scaffolding, I'm using the same assignment, I'm just providing some safety net. Differentiation, I'm altering it altogether. So when I look at differentiation and um, scaffolding, you might get the, well, that's not fair. Why does so-and-so have a different assignment? One second. My friends, I need you guys, I'm recording for my students. You need to go into the other room like I've asked you to, okay? Yay! Um, okay, so I want you to think about and have this in your mind that fair is not always equal. So I want you to think about doctoring. So thinking in this infographic here, you have students who go to, or you have kiddos who go to a doctor with different needs. I scraped my knee, my tummy hurts, I think my arm is broken, I have a cough. If the doctor did the same thing for all the students, that are the kiddos that came to his or her doctor's office, he would say, okay, here's some cough medicine, and it'll, it'll solve all of your problems. Well, that'll help the one kiddo with a cough, but that's not gonna help the broken arm or the tummy ache or the scraped knee. 
So when we're thinking holistically in our classrooms, we wanna think, how am I going to benefit all of my kiddos? All right, so think through that, and it's not necessarily everyone needs the same thing. Because even in our classrooms and in situations where we're the adult learner, we need different things. So we wanna start thinking about that as we, as we do lesson planning. So some myths and some misconceptions about what differentiation actually is. Differentiation is not simply for the gifted students or the students who come to you with special needs or um, on their IEP, it has um, a modification that is needed. It is not individualized instruction. It is not simply this student will go to um, this center. It is designed to meet the needs of all of my kiddos. It is designed to be ongoing and very flexible. It is designed to address multiple skills for my kiddos. So an effective, that bottom right hand bullet there where it says an effective philosophy that allows all learners to feel successful. We really want all of our students to feel very successful. So I want you to think about scaffolding and differentiation in a different light. It's not what I have to do for this kiddo. I want all my students to feel successful. So how are all of my learners going to be successful? Um, and I'm not, so I really want you to kind of think through and not think of it as, oh my goodness, it's one more thing I have to do for this one kiddo. I want you to think about globally for the whole classroom. And that would be some good conversations to have with some of your peers and your classroom teachers. So in order to meet students where they are appropriately, whether I'm scaffolding a lesson or differentiating my instruction, I have to know the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. So Eileen Raymond states, she's an educator researcher, she says the Zone of Proximal Development is the distance between what children can do by themselves and the next learning that they can do with help. So when you think about the zone of proximal development, we want to challenge and we want to push every kiddo that enters our classroom. But we don't want to push them so much that they get frustrated and give up. Think about yourselves. I know I, when I am challenged in the right zone, just enough challenge, I feel excited. I feel empowered. But if it's so much out of what I know, then I'm like, ugh, why even try? The same thing with our kiddos, no matter what age they are. And that's different for every student in your classroom. So you need to figure out what is that zone? What is that zone of proximal development for each child? And really, the only way we know any of this information is by establishing relationships. We say that a lot in our classes. So how are we going to figure out what is that zone for each kiddo? We have to do not just some diagnostic testing, but we just have to get to know our students. So know that the ZPD is so, so, so important as we go forward and do our lesson planning. So who needs scaffolding and differentiation? I need to scaffold my lessons anytime I bring in a new concept. And we've talked a lot about the I do, we do, you do model. So that looks like I am introducing a concept, I'm gonna do a think aloud, I'm going through the process as the teacher or the facilitator. Then we spend an undetermined amount of time in the we do stage. That's where the, the class helps you go through the process. You might have students coming up to that document camera or the whiteboard helping you walk through the lesson. This also looks like in a small group, I want you to work with your partners. Then finally, once I as the facilitator, the teacher in the classroom, believe that most of my students have a good handle on it, that's when we do the you do, when they do some individual instruction. So I'm differentiating and I'm thinking, how can I best serve my students? I need to figure out my ELL students, my strivers, and my thrivers. So this bottom bullet, I say, this will change each year. You need to differentiate for the Bradens, the Kiptons, and the Emmets in your classroom. Those are my three boys. So they all are very different, and I have to think about each student as an individual. What does Brayden need? Well, he understands that concept right away, and he might get bored. So what am I going to do that's not busy work for him, but to push him in his zone of proximal development? 
Kipton is very hands-on. He likes to work with and manipulate and figure out things outside of the box. So what am I going to do with this kid? I'm not going to give him a worksheet of 50 problems. I'm going to think about what's going to push and motivate him. And Emmett is my kiddo who loves to read and draw. So what am I going to do to make sure that that multiple intelligence level is there in my classroom? And I'm not just doing this for Brayden, for Kipton, and for Emmett. I'm doing this and putting it in my lesson plan, knowing that that specific kiddo will benefit, but more than likely, if I'm putting it in my lesson plan, more kiddos are going to benefit from it. So when I differentiate, I want to, I'm thinking specifically about one particular kiddo, but I'm making it available to all of my students, knowing that all my students can benefit. When we think about English language learners, a lot of time it's a struggle with um, some vocabulary acquisition. So if I'm thinking of word walls, if I'm thinking of um, how to break down vocabulary using pictures and videos and songs, that is absolutely going to help my ELLs but that's also gonna help every other kiddo in my classroom. So when I'm thinking differentiation, I might be in my brain thinking of a particular kiddo, but it's not just for that kiddo, it's for my whole classroom. I'm just putting it in my lesson, knowing that that is really gonna benefit X, Y, Z student. So here's an, another infographic, and you can pause the video and kind of look through what differentiation is versus what it is not. I'm not going to read through this with you, but it is a very good graphic to kind of wrap around your mind what it is and what it is not. So factors that affect um, second language acquisition. There are so many factors if you go through the research what can hinder and what can be a challenge and an obstacle for kiddos that come into my classroom where English is not their first language. So I want you to think about of these factors on the screen, what is it that you actually have control over and how does that affect your planning and teaching? There's very little that we have control over, but what we do have control over, the quality of instruction, the motivation, I have to know my kiddos. It all goes back to that, that um, relationship. I can't have rigor in my instruction without it being relevant and having a foundation of relationships. So always going back to what is it that I can control because I can't control their first language development. I wasn't there when they were born and in the first few years of their life. I can't control how they access language at home. I cannot control their cultural background and what mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, guardian helps bring to the table. I can be a partner and provide some resources, but I'm only in control in my classroom in the sense of my quality of instruction, how I differentiate, differentiate and think universally what's going to be best for all the kiddos in my classroom. I can also think about the peers and the role models that I could bring into to help be a resource for my kiddos. So we have to really be aware of what we do and do not have control over when it comes to not only second language acquisition, but life in general. And that can help us figure out, okay, this is not something that I have any control over. What can I do in my classroom? And that helps us going forward. So some guidelines to remember with our students who are acquiring a second language. We want to use facial expressions and actions and body language to help demonstrate. I think often when I, when I go through this particular slide with my students, Bueller, Bueller, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, completely monotone, there's no inflection in, in his voice, and it's funny for the movie purposes, but in a classroom, my students are falling asleep, there's no um, modeling of how language works with body language and facial expressions. There's also the other extreme where we can get all crazy with our hands and body language and it becomes distracting. So that's something we hone in our years and experience, but to be aware of it is very important. I need to also remember that with my academic vocabulary, I need to repeat that vocabulary often. One thing I love when I walk into classrooms and teachers refer to students as mathematicians when they're studying math. They're historians when they're reading through some primary source documents. They are investigators as they're going through some science. So really bumping up and using and repeating academic vocabulary very often is going to help students 
our ELLs, but thinking universally, it helps all of our kiddos develop a higher level of academic vocabulary. Using visuals and graphic organizers, providing hands-on learning, anything where we are activating those multiple intelligences, different ways of motivating our kiddos to learn, and of course, scaffolding as much as possible, where I'm modeling, we're working together, and then you do this on your own. So differentiation also works for our strivers and our thrivers. I use that term often, and not every educator does, and that's fine, that might be just a Liz-ism, but I think of my strivers instead of thinking of my struggling learners, because that is such a negative connotation. I don't wanna think of a kiddo as just struggling. They're striving to get better, they just need more support. Um, and then my thrivers are the ones that really just understand it on a surface level, but they need to be challenged. This is not extra busy work. This is not if you get done early, all you do is read. There's other things that I can do to challenge them in that zone of proximal development. How am I going to push them to challenge them and encourage them to be learners? So I want us to think about our strivers, our thrivers, and our ELL learners. So coming to multiple intelligence and how I can use that to differentiate instruction. There's a couple links on the online readings and videos that you can watch that help go through this even more. But I want you to think about different ways that motivate our kiddos to, to work, to think, to, to be critical thinkers. So they don't learn in the same way. How can I infuse music and art, other curriculum, what can I do to get to my kids? So I encourage you to go through the videos and the online readings to help really dive into how multiple intelligences can help you differentiate your instruction. I thought this was pretty interesting, a little background on vocabulary. Kids learn about 10 new words a day or about 3,500 new words a year. And most are learned by accident, but we need to increase the opportunities where students are having opportunities and experiences to learn academic vocabulary. Our reading ability is tied very closely to our vocabulary knowledge. So again, that's important as we're thinking about secondary language acquisition, as we're thinking about repeating vocabulary, how can I incorporate technology, incorporate multiple intelligences to increase my students' vocabulary awareness? The last bullet is, is unfortunate. Children from lower socioeconomic status learn about a quarter of the words as a student from a more affluent home. I have zero control about the backgrounds that my students come from. But what can I do to close that gap in my classroom? That's gonna be part of your um, evidence of learning assignments, is thinking through what can I do in my classroom to increase vocabulary acquisition, despite what odds, what obstacles, and what challenges might be facing our kiddos. There are different tiers for, for vocabulary. Your tier one are your basic words. Your tier three are the specialized words that we really don't use very often, and they're very content specific. But a majority of our academic words in our instruction fall in that tier two. So these are the academic words that um, really help to increase not only vocabulary acquisition and a higher level of learning, critical thinking, but our reading ability. And that's what our class here for content area literacy really goes back to is increasing our vocabulary and our reading comprehension. So, pardon me, our English language learners and vocabulary. So most tier ones, vocabulary, clock, baby, chair, they, they know, but it may be only in their native language. Tier two words, we have to do a lot of pre-teaching. We have to do a lot of reviewing, a lot of repeating, a lot of explicit instruction. Lots of languages are Latin-based. So how can I look for connections when a student comes to my classroom and is very limited in their English? I need to make connections. What can I do? And then tier three words are less useful for us because it's so specific to um, different content and they're very low frequency words. So we wanna spend a majority of our time in tier one and tier two as we're thinking about vocabulary acquisition for our ELLs. This will also tie into your evidence of learning assignment. This is a really cool infographic from Marzano. There are six steps that um, 
he puts forth through Learning Unlimited here, the process for building academic vocabulary. And I want you to think through these steps and how often do we take our students intentionally through these steps. I'm not gonna read them to you, I want you to pause and go through those steps. But it's very important that we don't skip through some steps and we just expect that if I say it five times, they're gonna get it. There's very specific and intentional steps with how I want my students to learn and acquire new language. 10 principles for effective vocabulary instruction, and I love this, 10 things to avoid. So it's interesting, some of the things on the not that list are things that I've done in the past or I've seen students do as they are doing their um, lesson plannings to their kiddos. So again, take a moment, pause and figure out um, what does this infographic do as far as um, giving you an idea of what to do and what not to do with vocabulary acquisition. I love this. Pinterest is one of my favorite things. It's a great tool for us as educators because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. These are just different um, ways that teachers have used vocabulary in the classroom, different ways to build vocabulary using those steps from Marzano. This, of course, is just a fraction of what you will find. But a part of your evidence of learning assignment is going to have you create a Pinterest board. And so some of these things are just straight from Pinterest. You can also Google search images on how to um, help with acquiring academic vocabulary. So what you're going to do is this is your um, one of your assignments. You're going to decide on a topic and a grade level focus for where you would like to increase student engagement. I give you an example, and if you look in Blackboard, it goes through and gives you um, a pretty good breakdown of, of that. You're going to create a Pinterest board of at least 10 pins of digital tools to increase student engagement of that particular lesson or activity. And I've created one for you using my example of a Socratic seminar in fourth grade. You're going to post a chart that's similar to the one that I do in um, the Blackboard um, assignment expectations, and you're going to post it to the blog section with your um, link to your Pinterest board. And then you're gonna comment on how you might use one of those pins in an upcoming assignment. I would love for you to focus on vocabulary because that is so integral into reading comprehension. However, it's not required. I want you to increase student engagement. And you can look through um, my Pinterest board to get an example. The other thing that I think is really cool, and if you click on, if you if you watch this video um, with the um, uh, PowerPoint as a full presentation, you can click on the hyperlink for the word music here. And there's different ways to do vocabulary acquisition. I love songs, I'm a terrible singer, but I think it's really fun. Um, we think of how do kids learn. A lot of times it's nursery rhymes or those sing-song words. I think of growing up the 50 Nifty United States song. I, I moved around a lot as a kiddo and when I was in sixth grade, I was in a new school and our teacher asked everyone, it was busy work and I recognized it that day and I especially recognize it now as an educator, um, that she wanted us to look at the map and put all the states in alphabetical order. There was she, mm -hmm. anyways, I won't go into that. But what was really cool is my first day of school, where I came from, we learned and performed the 50 Nifty United States song. So I was busting through Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, and I had everyone looking over and say, oh my goodness, Elizabeth, because I went by Elizabeth at that time, how in the world? And I just felt so smart because I learned this song to help me put the um, states in alphabetical order. I remember having to do the presidents in order, and I made up a song, um, Days of the Week. We do that in preschool with our kiddos. I know Emmett, my youngest, is, has learned that. Days of the week. Days of the week. There's Sunday and there's Monday, right? I'm not going to sing it for you because I really truly do have a terrible voice. And then the cleaning up song. We see this a lot in our pre-K and early elementary when the teacher sings a song or that certain song comes on the... Um, and the smart board, that means something to our kiddos. So the other assignment that you're gonna do is a super fun assignment, and I want you to have fun with this, and I would absolutely love for you to create something that your students are kind of maybe struggling with, and you're gonna choose a concept routine or a process. You're gonna take a well-known song, 
or a jingle, like a commercial jingle, and create a parody to teach us about whatever this concept, routine, or process is. And then you're going to video yourself doing it, and you're going to text it to me. In Blackboard, there's an assignment um, to upload. I do not want you to upload the video to Blackboard. Blackboard does not enjoy videos, as maybe you've learned in some of your other classes. I only want you to text me, and when you text me, um, it's not going anywhere, so it's just me as your audience, um, and please know I have a terrible voice, so there's zero judging on the artistic abilities of how well you see. What I'm looking for is are you thinking creatively and outside the box when you're um, identifying a concept, a routine, or a process? So when you text me, it'll just be a very short video. Make sure you tell me your name. Because it is um, online, I unfortunately don't get the opportunity to see your faces. So tell me your name and what the course number is of the 317 course, because I do have four sections, and I want to make sure I get your name to the correct grade. And then I will upload your grade into Blackboard, so you don't need to submit anything for this assignment. And I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with. All right, so we move into your application task. And this is going to be putting together all the information that you've received over the past couple modules. And we really are gonna be planning for instruction. So there's a lesson plan, and I will have the actual lesson plan uploaded as well. Um, but I want you to take some notes on what this lesson plan means. I did about a 30 minute video on lesson planning. So I will also attach um, that and I'll put that into the module. So if you want a little bit more in depth instruction on lesson planning, you can go to that one as well. So this will just kind of be a brief introduction. Those of you who have written lesson plans before, this might be a review and might have some aha moments for you. But I want you to think through the different chunks of the um, lesson plan. What is it that I need to teach and that needs to connect to my objectives? I need to activate my prior knowledge, right? Or the ELF, the engaged learning focus. How do I make it relevant? Why should they care? What vocabulary words are the key to unlocking whatever it is the concept that I'm trying to get across to my students? And then how am I going to teach it? How will my students be engaged? What literacy am I going to use? What writing? Is it writing to learn? Is it the writing process? Remember, those are two different things. What reading are they going to be doing? How are they going to be speaking and interacting with the content? And then I want to make sure that I'm thinking universally. How am I making sure that all my students are getting it? And then the assessment is how do I know that they understand it? And there's a couple different ways to do the assessments. So the objectives articulate the knowledge and skills that I want my students to know. My assessment is how I know that my students got the objective. And then my instructional strategies is how I'm gonna scaffold that information and foster the learning for my students. We have two different kinds of objectives. We have a content objective and a language objective. For the content objective, we have a formula, A, B, C, and D. And then the language objective, can also be addressed in the content objective, but that's really where I'm focusing on the reading, the writing, the listening, and the speaking. What literacy is being instructed? When I'm thinking of my objectives, I wanna make sure it's focused on student performance. It's measurable and observable. I can see it happening. I cannot see a student understand. I cannot see that. So that shouldn't be the verb that you use in the objective. And then what criteria will I use to make sure that that objective has been reached? So let's break it down. A is objectives are student-centered. It's my audience. A lot of times you'll see this written as students will be able to or swabot. My B is the behavior. It's a concrete action that I can see that makes that learning explicit. These are some verbs that you can use. Based on my cognitive level that I want my students to achieve, starting at the bottom, that knowledge, comprehension is next, application analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. There's some verbs that you can use. Making sure that it is measurable and it is observable. I cannot see a student understand. I cannot see a student comprehend. I cannot see a student learn. Those things I can't see, okay? So we wanna not use those. We're gonna keep breaking that down. Learning objectives should guide your selection of assessments. So they can't be vague. It needs to be very, very specific, all right? So we're gonna go through a couple of examples. Audience behavior, condition, and degree. There are two examples here. They're short, 
They're to the point, and they have each part of the formula for an objective. The audience, the students will be able to. The behavior, it starts with a measurable, observable verb. The condition is there, what materials are they gonna use? And then degree, what is considered successful? So for example, students will be able to sequence the story pictures from the graphic organizer with 100% accuracy. I know that my audience is students. I know that I can see somebody sequence because they're putting it in order. It's a physical picture from a graphic organizer. So I can watch them put it in order and I expect 100% accuracy. It's okay to have 100% accuracy. If I have four pictures and I've read them a story, I want them to know what happened first second, third, and fourth. That's okay to have 100% accuracy. My kindergartners should know their ABCs with 100% accuracy by the end of the year. Easy. There are times when maybe an 80% accuracy is okay. That's fine. That's in our second example. Swabot, which is short for students will be able to identify the key vocabulary from the article with eight out of 10 accuracy. So, if I miss one in vocabulary, I'm probably gonna miss two. So then I know as, a, as, a, as the teacher where I might need to go and refocus if I'm allowing an eight out of 10 accuracy, okay? So how can this look in the classroom? As you get to go into several different classrooms, you probably see a variety of ways that teachers put up on the board the expectations and what students are learning. So there are some that are easy to rewrite every day and of course when you go on Pinterest there are some people who spend 107 hours cutting out super cute little things. You don't have to spend 107 hours cutting out cute little things. The importance of objectives is that, is that students know your expectations. So as long as it is visual and you've gone over it, um, a lot of times I'll see students at the beginning of a lesson say, all right students, let's swab it out. And the students will repeat or a student will come to the front and point to the different things. The kiddos have to know their expectations. Think about yourself as you go through the courses um, for this program. If you're unsure of what the expectation is, it leads to some anxiety, it leads to frustration, it leads to um, a, a sense of, what am I supposed to do, right? I want clarification. Our kiddos are the same way. And sometimes they act out in a way that is disrespectful or they act out in a way that becomes a behavior management issue. So if I can establish in concrete detail what my expectations are, I don't have to get frustrated with the students because there's not that fluid line of what my expectation is. There it is, and you know it, and this is the consequence, right? So it really helps with our behavior management. We have four different types of assessments. We have assessments that happen before and during our activities, and then something that happens after. So our formative assessment before the activity. So this can be an anticipation guide, a pre-quiz, which will tie into your KPTP, your final semester of our program. Why do we do formative assessments? We have to establish their prior knowledge. We have to determine what strategies, what scaffolding, what differentiation do I need? If I come into a classroom and already have everything planned out for the whole year, I have no idea what kind of kiddos and where they are on different levels. So formative assessment is very important. I think about this sometimes too as a diagnostic that I do with my car. I know that there is a problem, but I have no clue what it is. So I take it to um, the automotive shop and they run diagnostics. They say, here are the 10 things that are wrong with your car. These two things, you gotta fix now or your car's gonna break down. These next five or six are probably good to do maybe within the next couple months. And these last two or three things, you could wait about a year before you got those done. Just like my car, I need to know based on formative assessments, what is something that I need to address right now with my kiddos? And then what's something that I can address a little bit later on down the road, okay? So my summative, think about summary that happens at the end, it's the after instruction. This can be something like an exit slip, a presentation, a portfolio. Please know that a summative assessment does not have to be a multiple choice quiz. Please know that a summative assessment does not have to be a formal test. It can be something that's very engaging and motivating for our students. 
okay? Why do we do summative assessments? We need to figure out, do I need to reteach anything? Maybe there's a couple kiddos who are still really struggling and I need to figure out some differentiation for those kiddos. We have formal and informal. Formal is going to be something that is individual. It's going to be paper, pencil, computer, test. This could be the presentation. Informal is something that happens all the time. It's the thumbs up for understanding. It's the fist to five, how well do you understand it? One thing that I loved walking into a classroom was this teacher used red and green solo cups. And in groups of four, students, um, there was one red and one green solo cup for each group of students. So when a teacher said, all right, I want you number heads together, figure this out, the students would get together. And if they understood and they had an answer, they would put the green on top. And if they weren't really quite sure and they needed to revisit something, they put the red on top. Loved it because I had an opportunity to share and collaborate and it wasn't just me by myself and I'm the only one with a red cup. All right, we, we provide opportunities for our students to um, chat with one another. How do assessments tie into your objectives and how can we use these as teacher tools? Very important questions to be asking yourself as you're writing your lesson plan. I wanna make sure that the assessments that I've chosen tie back into what it is that I hope my students have learned. That's a teacher tool because there's lots of things that I can do for assessment and lots of different things I can do for objectives, but they have to be together, otherwise what's the point? Your module four application task is going to be to create a, a portion of a lesson plan. You're gonna choose an article, and I know I've talked about ReadWorks before. You do have to create an account, but it's free and it's awesome and I highly recommend it. You're gonna use information from this class, the past several modules. You're going to include what you would do as before, during, and after reading strategies for your students to understand this article. So your audience is a group of your students and this does not have to be taught. So this can be something that um, is, just, is just designed and you're gonna turn it into me. It doesn't have to be something that's turned in for approval from your coach unless you wanna use it as your internship to where you're gonna video. But this is not required to video and actually teach it. I want you to think through the universal design of what um, scaffolding and differentiation you're gonna have to do for specific students. We're gonna pretend that you have ELL students in your class. We're gonna pretend that you have students in your class who are strivers. And we're gonna pretend that you have in your class thrivers. So you need to make sure that you address these specific kiddos. Student A moved from Mexico a year ago. She's in third grade. Student B, loves to move, loves to think outside the box, really duper, super duper smart, but he doesn't like to do the work and often has low grades because he doesn't wanna do the 50 math questions. He's in third grade. You have student C who is a challenge. She knows everything and she's not afraid to tell you that she knows everything. She's reading at a ninth grade level She's working in a math group using sixth grade math skills, but she loves to help others, but ends up distracting them because she understands the concept, so she just ends up chatting. So they're all in third grade. You need to make sure that as you're designing your lessons, how am I going to engage all of these types of students? I want you to include specific vocabulary strategies, and then you're gonna post your finalized lesson to um, Blackboard in the assignment. So I will be the one going through and giving you some feedback on this. It's not gonna be extensive feedback that your coach would get, but it would be specific to these expectations. So I want you to think through, how are we gonna scaffold and differentiate? How am I gonna make sure that I have the I do, we do, and you do? What does that look like? How am I differentiating for that sweet kiddo that just moved here a year ago? How am I differentiating for that kiddo who is smart but really likes hands-on and doesn't turn in his work? How am I going to differentiate for the kiddo who knows it all and is really significantly at a higher level than the majority of the students in, the, in her class? If you go to tips and tricks, this is a hyperlink, some pretty cool stuff there to help you out. So when you look at your lesson plan, you don't need to worry about standards for this, you don't need to worry about materials, and you don't necessarily need to worry about a closure. I do want to create a title. I do want you to try out how to write objectives. 
What I want you to know in my grading of this assignment is not perfection. My grading of this assignment is that you're really trying to think outside the box. My focus and purpose for this assignment is that you're thinking through a universal design. What can I put in a lesson to make sure that I've reached all the kiddos or a majority of the kiddos in my classroom to help them be successful with the article that I've chosen? So that's kind of what um, module four is all about. I told you at the beginning, this is one of my favorite classes to teach. I just think that strategies and tools and scaffolding for our kiddos is so important and so vital that um, I just, I really, really enjoy 317. So hopefully this has kind of helped clarify. It's minimized some anxiety and given you some specific expectations for your two evidence of learning assignments. Have fun with that video. And um, don't worry, there is absolutely zero judging on um, artistic and um, talent because I don't have any of that. And then have fun and, and creating your, your lesson plan for, for your students, okay? So um, email me with any questions that you have. And like I said, I'm opening this up early. It, it wasn't going to open up until next Sunday, but I thought if you had some extra time and wanted to get started, that is amazing. If not, no worries. Everything is due. It's new. It's a different date. It's by Friday this time, Friday, December 7th at midnight, instead of going through that next Sunday, because I want to have plenty of time to grade everything and turn in your, your um, final grades. So have a great day. Have a good Thanksgiving break, and um, we'll talk soon.